And good evening. Welcome to Voices from the Village, community television's longest-running public affairs talk program show. With your input, too, Santa Cruz, we love to hear from you. So do not forget, this is a live show on, geez, what is it, September 8th? And it is um, a call-in show, so we want to invite your, your feedback here as well. As you saw, um, tonight's topic is going to be Syria and the rise of the American national security state. There is a lot of talk in the news today about, um, you know, rationalizing and kind of finding convincing reasons to uh, attack Syria and to justify an American attack on Syria, supposedly in an effort to protect and preserve life, yet kind of that weird ironic thing, how can you protect and preserve life with bombs? So with us tonight, we're going to have two really amazing guests to talk about um, sort of perhaps a lot of the, the things that go unsaid in the mainstream media, community television, of course, trying to bring you, um, you know, not only the, the pundits and the special folks, but also people just like you and people here in your community. And we're really lucky to have with us tonight Stephen Zunis and Danny Sheehan, two distinguished um, academics and uh, activists, uh, organizers. Uh, I mean, really, Stephen Zunis is a professor of politics at San Francisco State and yeah, International University, University of San Francisco. Excuse me, University of San Francisco State. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know him. <laughs> I could get this right one day. Um, professor of Politics at University of San Francisco and also uh, International Relations as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. Great. And um, Danny Sheehan, of course, is the um, infamous, for lack of a better word, <laughs> um, lawyer that brought a lot of amazing kind of casework that perhaps even helps set up a lot of American politics today and, and kind of helps us understand a little bit about what it is that's happening today. So welcome to the show, um, both you guys. Thank you, Senor. Um, so tonight's topic, Syria and the rise of the American security state. I mean, it's kind of two different things, but I think uh, they are related. I and mean, we were talking a little bit beforehand about how they were. So why don't I pitch that um, question to you, either one of you first. Like, like, how is tonight's topic related to that? Well, let's, let's, let's point out that the, this, this uh, latest uh, issue that's arisen about the potential unilateral authority of the president to launch a military strike against one of the Middle Eastern countries, all of this has flowed from that immediate period right after the end of the Cold War, mm -hmm. uh, when the Soviet Union dissolved on December 31st of 1991. We saw the uh, George Bush Sr. administration move very quickly to try to communicate with uh, Saddam Hussein to suggest to him that it was okay to go in and invade Kuwait if, he, if Saddam thought that they were stealing his oil. And that instigated a whole chain of events uh, in the Middle East, pursuant to which the administration, uh, in that case the Bush senior administration with, with uh, Dick Cheney as their Secretary of Defense and, uh, and the, the others that were in there that were the generators of the Project for a New American Century, they, they determined that they were going to assert unilateral domination of the Middle East to take control of the, of the oil fields. And that whole, this whole thing has, has been flowing out of the effort of the, of the United States administrations to seize control of the oil fields at the end of the Cold War, as soon as they realized the Soviet Union was not going to be there as their adversary. The that's, what, that's what all of this is about. And so the, the, the uh, sending of United States military forces into the Middle East to occupy uh, in Saudi Arabia to allegedly push Saddam Hussein back out of Kuwait, then to establish the uh, no-fly zone that was there, uh, which generated the whole uh, rising up of the jihad. Uh, in the Middle East, uh, led by the Muslim Brotherhood. What we're seeing now are the, are the logical consequences of this type of aggressive action on the part of the United States to establish what it is that Paul Wolfowitz and uh, Dick Cheney referred to at the end of the Bush administration as full-spectrum dominance on the part of the United States. And these are the Muslim Brotherhood people fighting back in any way that they can think of to, uh, to attack us, mm -hmm. which we've now characterized <clears throat> as terrorism, and we're now using it as the new ultimate boogeyman to be able to justify mm -hmm. the American national security state, which had previously been rationalized on the basis of anti-communism. That's what this is all about. Mm -hmm. Stephen? Yeah, I, I'd add, add to it that um, you know, Americans, I think by nature, you know, do not support an imperialist foreign policy, that uh, they'd rather have our, our resources and our attention uh, here at home 
if uh, we could get our energy needs met you know, by uh, renewables and, um, and, and other you know, safer means uh, that would not just be better in terms of the uh, climate, uh, but in, in terms of, of not having to, to engage in the enormous sacrifices that wars of conquest um, you know, tend to have. I, uh, most Americans would prefer that. So we often couch this in, in either idealistic terms, um, as in, you know, um, you know, supporting democracy or, you know, you know, the as, rights you know, of oppressed minorities. Exactly, exa- 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 exactly. Or, or the you know, old Cold War you know, uh, fears of you know, scaring, scaring people, basically. Right. Um, I, the, I, and I think, think uh, that the, um, uh, Dan outlined things fairly well. I just uh, specify that Muslim Brotherhood is one of a number of, um, of yeah. Islamist uh, movements. And actually, in many ways, they're not, they're not the most threatening. Um, you know, Al-Qaeda and some of the more radical Salafist groups are, are more extreme. But that, uh, you know, the... the um, and it's not that, that you know this is this is all manufactured. It's, they're, they're, these 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 guys are, are real. They're bad guys. But uh, the question is, what kind of policies make us more uh, uh, safer? And so, even if you put around uh, put aside the moral questions and the legal questions, just in terms of America's own national self interest, right. um, I've 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 spent time. I've I've studied the Middle East and traveled the Middle East for forty year, for you know a good forty years now. And I, I must say that the, the more the United States has militarized the region. The less secure it become, that it creates its own um, reaction, and uh, it, 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 we're attacked not not we're, uh, we're attacked not because uh, they hate our freedoms, uh, but because our policies in the Middle East have had very little to do with freedoms. Right. It's been about supporting uh, repressive regimes and, and and occupying armies. And the enemy of our enemy is our friend, right? I mean, you look at someone like Osama bin Laden being used by the United States to kind of achieve these foreign policy goals, mm-hmm. and then I think the term is blowback, right? Like mm-hmm. the exactly. kind of Exactly. Unintended consequences mm-hmm. of this militaristic kind of policy, and, mm-hmm. and seems uh, seems quite amazing. So, I mean, I guess with respect to, to Syria, would either one of you like to sort of update our viewers for those who don't know essentially what what is the situation in Syria? I was I was shocked to, to talk to a couple of people that really didn't quite understand that this has been going on for like two three yeah. years. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. In March, really nothing new in March of two thousand eleven, uh, there was a. a, a a largely spontaneous and nonviolent pro-democracy struggle that included people from all the different sectarian communities. Uh, they wanted a, a more progressive, inclusive um, Syria. They were tired of the corruption, authoritarianism of the Assad regime. Many of these people were leftists. Many of them, in, in, in fact, uh, were... Um, and, and, and they, they were. And one of the interesting things, despite the socialist uh, uh, you know, label of the Ba'ath Party, this was the most working class base of all the Arab Spring revolutions because it, it was it, it, it had the only way that uh, Bashir Assad had liberalized relative to his father is economically <laughs> and, and create and, and expand on this crony capitalist class. Um, I, I really have problems. A lot of people on, on the left that, that assume because um, Assad is challenging American hegemony, he, he, he and his regime are therefore progressive. They're not. Uh, right. but, um, but this movement was a very exciting movement, and, and it was faced with terrible repression from the regime. And, and uh, the more they were pressed, the more people came out on the streets. And a lot of people from the military, uh, refusing orders to shoot down and un- shoot down unarmed uh, demonstrators, threw down, you know, th- th- you know, joined the other side basically. Unfortunately, they, they brought their guns with them and formed this thing called the Free Syrian Army, saying they were going to protect the population from attacks by the by the state. But of course, it gave the state the excuse to attack even more, and the death toll went up tenfold. And as the as the armed m- movement spread, not only did that suppress the nonviolent pro democracy movement, it brought in all these really sketchy elements of these uh, uh, sal- uh, Salafist extremists, including some allied to Al Qaeda. And even within, you, you, so you have all these different factions. In fact, the Pentagon estimates there are literally more than a thousand different separate armed militia wow. within the free Syrian army umbrella alone. And this is in addition to the, uh, the, the al-Qaeda types and the more extremists outside of that. And, and among these thousand uh, or so, some are those that are, are fighting, are, are leftist groups and nationalist groups that are you know, fighting you know, for a genuinely free Syria. But a lot of them are as bad as the uh, uh, Salafists and, and, and al-Qaeda. So this is the mess that it's in. It's become... Um, and the people, the, the, and and, and um, they're they're not a lot of good guys anymore. Yeah. So largely, kind of, kind of, what was characterized largely as like the Arab Spring, essentially mm-hmm. like a kind of movement within Syria as part of this larger mm-hmm. uh, phenomenon, um, essentially kind of faced repression, and as a result, certain factions went violent. Now we have this conflict that's dragged on for 
about a year, two yeah, years. The arm, the arm, the, the, the initially nonviolent movement started about uh, two and a half years ago. Yeah. The arm struggle commenced about two years ago, and the uh, arm movement ended up becoming the predominant uh, um, uh, mode of mode of struggle of about a year and a half ago. Yeah. Wow. And as I point out, that all of this flows from the the decision that was made, the strategic decision that was made right at the end of the Cold War. Uh, on behalf of the George H. W. Bush administration, right. they established a, a doctrine that was uh, that was set forth in the 1992 United States Defense Department Policy Planning Guidance Document, in which they initially proposed having the United States assert its unilateral domination in the Middle East. Yeah. And when, in fact, the the New York Times and Washington Post got wind of what it is that they were proposing, they editorialized against it. And so they came out with a second draft that was called The Projection of U.S. Military Power into the 21st Century and Beyond. And in it, it expressly states that the purpose of this is to maintain the continued privileged access to the strategic raw materials that are needed by the members of the Northern Industrial Alliance. And this was a brand new thing that arose right at the end of the Cold War. This Northern Industrial Alliance was established among the United States, Canada, Mexico, which is not the indigenous Mexican people, but the pre, the, the uh, Spanish ruling, uh, the class, ruling class, and the United Kingdom, uh, and uh, Spain, and Italy, and the new reunified Germany. And they actually stated in it, they would ask Russia to come and join this new Northern Industrial Alliance now that they have spun off all of their ethnic provinces, which means all of their non-Caucasian provinces. So what you see here is a grand alliance of Caucasian nations in the Northern Hemisphere that uh, George H.W. Bush uh, has been trying to get into, into coordinated uh, uh, activity against the Muslim world, against the, the, uh, the uh, non-Caucasian world to, to hold on to power when they constitute a minority in the world, but that they want to dominate and control the strategic raw materials that they need for their war-making capacity. That's what's happening in the Middle East. And we pointed this out. We pointed this out when we uncovered the enterprise in the Iran Contra uh, scandal, mm -hmm. trying to point out to them this, and I've 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 written about this in the book that is recently being published now. This is published be published originally uh, on the 24th of September, called the People's Advocate, and this is an analysis of the cases that we did back during that period of time at the Christic Institute. Uh, trying to warn people about the rise of this American national security state, okay. and uh, that's that's what uh, that's what the, that's what this is about. Uh, and this book leads on into it, and we're we're in the process of writing a second book now called Rulers of the Realm, that wow. will actually follow up on this and show where it is we've come to now, uh, in the face of all of these warnings that were presented, including by Lawrence Walsh. The, uh, the uh, special prosecutor in the, in the Iran-Contra case who pointed out that because the Republican Party and the Democratic Party combined lacked the political will to punish those men that they caught uh, under the leadership of Oliver North, right. the deputy director for anti-terrorism in the National Security Council, because they refused to punish those people and push them back, he warned, he warned, Lawrence Walsh warned, that we were going to, in the very near future, face a rise of a major national security state, all under the rationale of anti-terrorism. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we're facing, and this is just the latest instance in which they are attempting to invoke the threat of terrorism to yeah. justify unilateral mm. military action on the part of the United States military to establish full-spectrum dominance over the Middle East. And I think it's important to point out that um, I mean, not everybody who advocates intervention in Syria, for example, is coming from this place. Many, many, yeah. uh, a lot of people are, are based on a sincere, if n very... Um, Tragically misguided, in my view, but a sincere uh, liberal internationalism, you know, trying to, right. you know, uh, 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 you know uh, uh, punish or create a deterrent uh, for future uh, use of um, uh, chemical weapons and, and whatever. But um, the problem is because of this history of the United States, yeah. uh, because the people of the Middle East, uh, even those who oppose Assad, <laughs> uh, you know, see, see, recognize the United States uh, as an empire based, uh, with, right. with, with this kind of hegemonic agenda. Um, unilaterally taking, um, attacking Syria or any other country is going to create a nationalist backlash. So if you really want to, to I mean, you know, people say, well, you know, why would Assad, you know, assuming that he did it, why would Assad use these chemical weapons or whatever, you know, and he, he'd probably get this kind of reaction. Well, maybe he did that deliberately. 
And the reason I'm saying that is for whatever material, physical damage, the United States might be able to, um, to through its cruise missiles, uh, uh, do to the uh, infrastructure of the Syrian armed forces, Assad is going to gain politically. Uh, because one thing makes Assad different than Gaddafi or Mubarak or Ben Ali, the other dictators that have been overthrown, is that he still has a social base. A minority, but a fairly sizable minority, uh, because he's been able to use divide and rule with the sectarian minorities. He's, he has he's, he's um, the, the, the crony capitalist class, the Ba'ath Party apparatus, the military, much more of an oligarchy than a one man one man rule. But also, he's been able to manipulate that that strong sense of nationalism that the, the Syrians have. And any country that's being bombed, people are going to rally around the flag. Right. I mean, I, I, I'm friends with the young Serbs who who led the pro democracy struggle that eventually brought down Milosevic, and they said the bombing of their country set their cause back. They were out on the streets defending the government, you know, the very, very right. people who, you know, oppose right. most of it so much. Similar thing here. It's going to, it's going to end up um, getting, it's going to solidify the regime. Also, you know, the, any hope we had of maybe splitting, you know, the Ba'ath Party, you know, encouraging the moderates, you know, some internal coup or something to go to negotiations, they're going to close ranks. Right. They're going to close ranks uh, if, um, if, if the, um, U.S. starts bombing. So, and, and if we think of our history in Syria, our attacks on Syrian forces in Lebanon in, in the 1980s, uh, the, um, um, you know, the Syrian Accountability Act of 2003, where we uh, unfairly singled out you know, um, Syria and a whole uh, laundry list of things where we, you know, um, um, for these punitive sanctions. Uh, the, um, uh, it was based on all this hyperbole, all this exaggerations and, and, and double standards. It was really disgusting. And then we had the, um, um, when, when Syria actually proposed in 2003 a, a weapons of mass destruction free zone for the entire Middle East right. um, when, they, when they had a non permanent seat on the UN Security Council, and the US blocked it. Wow. Um, when they sued for peace with Israel, Assad told the Israelis, give us back the occupied Golan Heights. Uh, and we will give you full diplomatic and economic relations. We'll demilitarize the Golan. You have international peacekeeping forces, the security guarantees, land for peace, like UN Security Council Resolution 242, whatever you, you know. Um, and uh, and, yeah, and the Bush administration pressured the Israelis to reject it. Um, as Condoleezza Rice told uh, Shimon Peres, don't even think about it because the, we did not want to give Assad a political victory by right. getting his land back. So when we, we have that kind of history, all, you know, I see you know, 90 something percent of the people in Syria, whether they oppose the regime or, 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 or support the regime, don't like the United States as, as policies in the right. region. And if the U.S. starts bombing them, again, it's just going gonna, it's gonna to play right into um, um, uh, uh, Assad's hands, right into his narrative that we are the last bastion of secular Arab nationalism fighting both the, the uh, uh, Islamist extremists and, and Western imperialism. And, and, and again, it, it, again even, putting, it. Putting a legal, even putting a legal and moral um, arguments aside politically would be a really dumb thing to do. And, and it's, the, it's also important to point out, I think, that there's a very dangerous moment here that we're, we're in because, because Obama, in, in kind of a, a liberal moment uh, of actually paying some respect to the Constitution, uh, said that he thought that it was important for him to go to the Congress to try to get support from the popular representatives if he was going to undertake this kind of unilateral military action that the fact that he has gone to the people and there is a substantial chance that he's going to lose, mm -hmm. uh, that there's a major mobilization in the House of Representatives right now in which almost all of the members of the Progressive Caucus, all 61 members of the Progressive Caucus who are opposing unilateral military action, join together with some of the tea, pot, tea, tea bag people and the others uh, are, are going to join together and they very likely can establish a coalition that can deny him the authority to do this. And it's going to be extremely difficult for him to try to then take unilateral action after having been denied support on the part of Congress. Right. And there's a United States Supreme Court decision uh, called Youngstown Sheet and Tube versus uh, Sawyer that was decided back during the Korean War when Truman attempted to unilaterally seize the, the steel mills and run the steel mills on the grounds of national security because of the emergency we were in with Korea. Uh, to break the strike, basically. To break the strike of the, of the United Steel Workers. And the, the, the bottom line is that Justice Jackson uh, issued a concurring opinion in that United States Supreme Court case in which he said that, that if, in fact, the Congress acts 
uh, in an area where they have co-responsibility with the executive branch and tells the executive branch they cannot engage in a particular form of conduct, the president's power is at its absolute lowest at that yeah. point. And that will be true as to what happens here. The danger is, not that the danger is, is that we won't invade, uh, <laughs> invade Syria. The oh, real God. danger is that the forces of reaction, the national security state advocates, are going to come in and say, see, this is what you get if the president tries to ask, ask for support from yeah. Congress. Which and is these, extremely different than what, what Bush is doing. We're looking at two completely absolutely. different models at, at here. The same, absolutely. At the same time, absolutely. we could talk about yeah. that a bit because absolutely. it seems like a lot of people are saying that this is a very intelligent move by Obama. It's kind of calculated. Like, mm-hmm. I'm just kind of curious what you two would think because I've heard a lot of yeah. different opinions about the, the maneuver because yeah. some, some are arguing, oh, it's taking, the, like you're saying, essentially yeah. the American president's power away by doing that. This is, this Bush is had all, established this, this privilege, this is, quote unquote. This is but, all power that was seized yeah. actually by Reagan and the Bushes. that They kept insisting, uh, and with John Yu writing mm-hmm. these legal yeah. briefs for them and David Addington, that, that they somehow had this kind of unilateral authority to engage mm-hmm. in this type of conduct, uh, no matter it, it, again, back to the Iran-Contra case, of the, in absolute defiance of the Congress. The Congress passes the Boland Amendment in March of 1984, expressly telling the executive branch they have no authority to give any military aid to the Contras, who've been declared international criminals by the Geneva Court, and they go right ahead and do it anyhow. Right. Uh, and, and they were arguing that they had the authority to do this, especially if Congress, knowing they have done it, doesn't take steps to punish them. That is a common law acceptance of what they've done. It's acquiescence in the, mm-hmm. uh, the accretion of more and more power on the part of the executive and branch. It seems like the saddest thing is that there were people that were convicted in the Iran Contra scandal. You know, all sorts of different kinds of charges, but essentially all of them were pardoned. Were pardoned and, oh, yeah. and then reserved again yeah. 20 years later. Well, actually, in the second many, many of them, many so. of them weren't convicted yet. He he actually issued the pardon mm-hmm. before they were even before tried. Even so we, we never even got get a out chance. of jail free. Yeah, we, we never yeah. even got. A chance mm-hmm. to present the evidence against them, which the Christic Institute had actually put together yeah. and mm-hmm. presented to a Florida court. Uh, you know, we, we had all the evidence there, and, and that is why the special prosecutor said that in light of how obvious the evidence is against them, if you let these people off now, yeah. that this precedent is going to be horrible because these national security state been. these mm-hmm. national security state advocates under the rubric of anti-terrorism are going to be asserting that they have the power to unilaterally act like this. So Obama, the, it, it may it may turn out strangely enough that of the two terms of the Obama administration, the most important single thing, the only liberal thing mm-hmm. that he has done. Uh, other, other than the Health Care Act, which was basically a subsidy to the, to the insurance, insurance companies, companies. that you know the, the most mm-hmm. liberal thing he's done is go to Congress in this particular effort. And if Congress exercises his power to stop him from doing this, mm-hmm. that will be the precedent. Yeah. That in mm-hmm. fact, yeah. we, we as the American mm-hmm. people through Take our representatives have back, taken eh? back our yeah. power from mm-hmm. this unilateral executive yeah. uh, who has been just just carving out more and more power under the rubric of anti-terrorism which was explicitly intended by the, by the George H.W. Bush administration to be the new rationale, the new ultimate other right. for the national security state. And that's what, you know, one would have assumed that the National Security Act of 1947 that was passed in order to combat communism in the Soviet Union, one would have logically thought that immediately after the, the dissolution, the voluntary dissolution of the Soviet Union, that one would have moved to dissolve the National Security Act right. to do away with the Central Intelligence Agency National Security Council, but no, what they did is they immediately moved to try to fill in that vacuum to have a new right. ultimate other new boogeyman uh, in, in the new boogeyman, and that's Noriega, exactly, that's, right. that's, Saddam that's Hussein, the, the, tar, yeah. the, the dart boards, right? The yeah. monthly dart board yeah. as to who the new head of the, and now they've settled on the the terrorists, right. who they keep falsely professing to be trying to attack us because they they disagree with our way of life. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the reality is war on a verb. Yeah, you know, the America. reality is that we put two hundred and fifty thousand U.S. military military troops into the Middle East and occupied their holy lands, yeah. just exactly like Osama bin Laden informed uh, King Faoud in Crown right. Prince Abdullah back mm-hmm. in, in August of 1991 was going to happen if they allowed them to come right. in to try to remove Saddam Hussein. They were going to stay there. They were going to occupy the Middle East. And that is what generated the entire jihad, yes. uh, led led in part yeah. by Osama mm-hmm. bin Laden, but also by the Saudis. So by, this you total know, vacuum. I mean, this yeah. history is yeah. amazing because yeah. this total vacuum in modern 
day politic about like sure. this is just the context is just absent. They're, they're not, and, no and one's and that, talking about the past. And we yeah. need to talk about that. And, and that, that's where I think if we can stop this, uh, can uh, uh, get the House of Representatives to um, I, probably probably can't get the Senate to stop it, but but the, right. the House of Representatives has voted it down. It would be a major victory. Yeah. Um, now, why you're asking why why Obama might might have done that? I, there's there's I've heard all sorts of speculation. One was that as a constitutional lawyer. He actually had the integrity to realize that that uh, that it would, that he had no choice. Pro- yeah. Probably Larry Tribe called him up and said, <laughs> said "You know, Barack, yeah. you know, you know, I gave you an A in this course, and you need to, you need to earn it now. Right. I you will know, revoke it. Yeah, um, <laughs> I'll take your grade yeah, back. GPA um, is going to drop." <laughs> right. Another was that uh, I think he may have known that it was it was going to be a risky uh, maneuver that it, it, it might not go so well. So if it does go bad, that he had political cover. Yeah, that way right. he didn't right. do it unilaterally. You know, that yeah. he had 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 Congress, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, behind him. Yeah. You know, so I, I, I've even heard speculation that he he um, he's doing this deliberately because he was getting a lot of pressures from very very powerful uh, powers that be to go ahead and do this to 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 and, and, and aid. And he was he's actually hoping that Congress will prevent him from doing it. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure about that one, but it's plausible, I suppose. Right. Um, the um, but but uh, I should also mention that the the um, the anti-war sentiment in in um, in Congress is very mixed. I mean, you do have uh, a lot of uh, of uh, you know, progressive Democrats who oppose it for all the right reasons. You also have these kind of libertarian type you know, Republicans, uh, you know, and uh, you the, the Ron Paul and the Ron Paul, Ron Paul yeah, types yeah. who are very much yeah. opposed. You also have a lot of these um, you know crazy right wingers who um, um, will say anything. Will say, anything, anything Obama yeah, if Obama yeah. wants it, they're going to be right. against it. They right. want they want they want it to weaken the presidency. Yeah, they want to have it. In fact, I think Will Durst had a column today. As Republicans uh, can't decide uh, or. Uh, um, uh, uh, you know what, what, what their priority should be: their 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 their, their hatred, their hatred of Obama, or their their insatiable desire to bomb the hell out of the Middle Eastern country. You know, and they got to decide between right. these two. You know, um, but, thank, but, um, thank goodness, yeah. um, bomb brown people displaying Obama. Yeah. <laughs> but, but regarding regarding your, your this this, uh, this broader thing, I, I think uh, the, the background you're telling you're, you're saying, which I think, which is which is quite quite accurate. I think that uh, the. Um, it would be very. I think it would be indeed a. Um, um, we really putting the skids on this if we can. We can stop stop this. I think this would be a very, um, um, a very important important step. Uh, basically, uh, I should mention that uh, Sam Farr, um, our local congressman, was one of the first uh, dozen or so members of the House of Representatives to come out against right. uh, the war uh, resolution. Uh, Anne Eshoo, uh is is at this point undecided. Um, and uh, so she she uh, sh- should be receiving end of of, um, of uh, you know phone calls and, yeah. and emails and the like. Um, unfortunately, both our senators, including Barbara Boxer, who opposed the Iraq War, has, yeah. have gone out in support of it. And, and Nancy Pelosi, who opposed the Iraq War, has been really pushing hard uh, on, on the on the House side from her position as Democratic leader. Yeah. Well, we, we need we need to talk a lot more about these things. And and uh, the, for example, we're we're going to be gathering at the at Logos on the twenty fifth uh, of September uh, to, to discuss this book. It's not a big deal about the book itself; though people should go get it. The, the The reality is is that the subject matter of it, the the analysis of the rise of this power right. uh, at the end of the Cold War, and understanding where it's going to be leading us, and the fight that the Christic Institute undertook to try to stop this thing from happening while there was still time. Uh, that, that's the kind of discussion we have to have at Logos at, uh, at 7 p.m. So on, the, on, the, on the 25th. We're going to be having a discussion at Cruzio's uh, on the 19th. Uh, of this month, September. At, at Cruzio's the 19th of September, like from 5:30 to 7:30. Uh, we're also going to have another discussion about it uh, at the, the the Santa Cruz Bookshop. Uh, the date you just have to get a hold of the Santa Cruz Bookshop to know what the date that is. But it's going to but be probably in, in September. Yeah. We, we need, to, in my opinion, is that what we need to do is we need to have some discussion about establishing constitutional protection zones, very much like we did back during the Karen Silkwood case uh, with with regard to the nuclear issue. When the, when the executive administration was talking about moving uh, the uh, bomb-grade uh, waste materials from the, from the uh, 103 uh, private uh, nuclear reactors around the country, we, uh, we organized the city councils and county boards of supervisors to pass nuclear-free zone resolutions right. to prohibit them from taking these materials through the zone through the and, and actually force them to stop the whole program. Yeah, Santa Cruz is one of the first, Santa actually. Cruz is one of the very first, and we should do it again. We should declare a, a, a constitutional protection zone where they absolutely refuse to enforce those provisions of the Patriot Act, 
in the National Defense Authorization Act that authorize federal officials to arrest American citizens with no probable cause to believe that we've committed any crime at all, to put us in front of military tribunals, convict our American citizens uh, with a, a less than even a, a unanimous verdict of the military tribunal, put you in military prison uh, for life if they choose to do so without ever presenting the witnesses against you uh, to cross again. This, this is the most outrageous uh, statute that has been passed since the yeah. Alien Institute. Act, and yet people are sitting here like frogs being cooked in warm water. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, the, the reality is. What we, are we doing in this hand basket? And why is yeah, it getting warm? Yeah, that's exactly. Mm-hmm. That we, we we need we need to gather together and talk about this. So yeah. so let's gather together at Cruzio's on the 19th of this month at 5:30 in the afternoon. Great. Let's gather at the Logos on the on the 25th, uh, and let's let's contact the the Santa Cruz Bookshop to hold these these uh, gatherings where we can discuss what the history is that's led up to these. Uh, because they 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 confined me. They actually, the publishers confined me to only 600 pages in this book. I, I submitted a 1,300-page tra- uh, manuscript that talked in detail about this incident mm-hmm. of Dick Cheney basically inviting Prince Bandar into the White House right at the, right uh, after right after George Herbert Walker Bush sent the handwritten memo to Saddam Hussein through uh, April Gillespie mm-hmm. telling him that if Saddam Hussein felt required to use military mm-hmm. force against against Kuwait that he sh- should feel free to do so you know that that these these pieces of history need to be discussed by the American people and tell everybody they know about this, mm-hmm. so that we can mobilize opposition to this type of mm-hmm. unilateral action. My understanding was slightly different that that it was it was more along the lines of that the United States did not take a position either way. No, actually, actually the, the quote was that was in the handwritten memo, which I've got a copy of, mm-hmm. was that he, that uh, that uh, George H. W. Bush wanted to let Saddam Hussein know that if in fact he found it necessary to resort to the use of military force. If he thought that Kuwait was slant drilling under his boundaries to steal their oil, that it would not be deemed to be contrary to the long-term best interests of the United States. Mm-hmm. That was the actual yeah. term yeah. that he used. Yeah, the, the, the big scandal I think yeah. in, in, in during that period, of course, was that uh, the um, um, when uh, when Cheney and other people went to to, to Riyadh to convince yes. the um, uh, Saudis to allow American troops the first time yes. to be yes. on their soil, and they they came with these um, supposed satellite footage yes. that, that they claimed was showed uh, massive amounts of, of Iraqi troops, uh, more than you need for an occupation for a small country, yeah. and they are. Uh, massing on the border of Saudi Arabia, like yeah. they're opposed to, opposed yeah. to invade. Well, the St. Petersburg Times and Florida newspaper uh, got a hold of uh, some some um, Russian uh, weather satellite um, footage of that period. Sent it to these expert analysts of that day that supposedly happened. They said there were only half as many troops as the Bush administration was claiming, and they were not massing on the border poised to invade, but were actually digging in defensive positions around around Kuwait yeah. City. Yeah. Uh, so, so even the uh, so, so you know. E- um, so again, I, the, the, I personally believe that the reports of you know, a chemical uh, weapons attack by the Syrian uh, regime uh, are probably true. Uh, the, the fact that we've been lied to so many it's times like, about right. the about right. stuff around the Gulf War, around Iraq yeah. having chemical and biological yeah. weapons and weapons programs yeah. and nuclear weapons programs yeah. ties to Al Qaeda. I mean, we, we've been lied to so much. Yeah. This is uh, this is. Um, well, they, I, they can only they can only cry wolf with so many times. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, 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 and people just yeah. absolutely refuse to believe yeah. them. Right, right. And that's all, what the that's the problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. That's exactly right. Yeah. So, so again, I, that, that's so. so I, you know, I, I tell some of my liberal friends who are supporting supporting the war that uh, again, again, the okay. Uh, even if you even if you do you know you know believe that there are sort of cases like where humanitarian intervention might not, might be appropriate, the United States is the last country to do that, yeah. given our reputation. Even we, even if we, uh, even assuming we are telling the truth about what's going on in Syria, nobody believes us anymore. Well, given plus, that plus plus the evidence that we actually <laughs> supplied you know uh, deadly gases and uh, deadly uh, te- gas for killing people to Saddam Hussein. Yeah, and not only that, yeah, 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 they are the, the raw they, materials. They supplied the, the raw, materials. The raw materials in their in their um, uh, chemical weapons were supplied by the United States for pesticide and pesticides and in, um, fertilizer and the like. Congressional hearings in the 1990s showed that the Iraqis were um, uh, uh, using this material uh, to, to make chemical weapons, uh, no objections. And, and, and here's the scary part, and this, I, I wrote about this some years ago, but it's actually finally come out officially in CIA <laughs> documents. There are officials from the Defense Intelligence Agency on the ground in Baghdad during the Iran-Iraq war 
using U.S. satellite footage to show the, um, the Iraqi armed forces where there are concentrations of Iranian troops and the full knowledge that they would use that information and use chemical weapons against them. And we were supplying the intelligence yeah, yeah. to show them. Exactly, the exactly, exactly, exactly. To, and knowing they so were the raw right. materials and the intelligence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, exactly in fact, right. even when they attacked Halabjo, you know, that was, it was a Kurdish town that had been taken over by pro-Iranian Kurdish rebels and, and, and some attacked them. Over 5,000 civilians were killed. The U.S. initially tried to cover up for it by trying to blame the Iranian that were then the preferred enemy. And then ironically, full 15 years after the fact, and 10 years after Iraq had completely eliminated their chemical weapons, that was used as an excuse for the U.S. to invade and occupy Iraq. Right. So, so the, the, there was, there was the joke, right, that uh, you know, the United States is absolutely sure that you know, Iraq has these weapons of mass destruction because we still have the receipts. Yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> and, and, and so what we're saying is that, that people need to focus on this moment to, right. to contact uh, not, only, not only Sam Farr to support him in what he's doing and, and to support all the members of the Progressive Caucus who are opposing this resolution, but to, to try to call all of their relatives in the other <laughs> states around the country to get them to contact their congresspeople. This is such an important moment to turn back the rising tide of this um, uh, American national security state and the attempt to usurp more and more unilateral authority on the part of the president. This is the exact moment where they need to, they need to have their voices heard. Uh, you know, that we, we don't always keep calling people to call up every week to your congressman about mm -hmm. something, but this is an extraordinary, extraordinary strategic moment right. uh, in a turn back of this, this whole dynamic that's been going on ever since basically December 31st of 1991, when the Soviet Union basically backed out of the Cold War and created this vacuum uh, where we, the United States, had an opportunity to rise to the higher angels of our nature and actually establish a peaceful world. Peace uh, dividend uh, that was squandered. Gorbachev, Gorbachev uh, convened the State of the World Forum, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to bring in former presidents and former secretaries of state and secretaries of defense to come in, who are now unbridled by being in office, to tell about the need to establish a new paradigm, a new post-Cold War paradigm. And you know, we, we kept scrambling at that because we were all participating in that to try to get this, uh, this established, an agreement established before the United States zealots, the national security state advocates, figured out some other alternative. But we, we realized that now they were active the very Monday, mm -hmm. the Monday morning when Paul Wolfowitz you know, came into the, came into the uh, West Wing and, and brought in uh, Doug Fife and, uh, and uh, David Addington mm -hmm. and Elliot A A Abrams and mm -hmm. all of them and crafted that very first uh, 1992 United States Defense Department policy planning guidance document mm -hmm. calling for full spectrum dominance. Yes. An absolute reactionary return to the late 19th century imperialist policies that had obtained before the Soviet Union arose to right. be a counterforce yeah. to that. And just let me mention as a little side here because I know Go that there are some people, uh, the most famously, um, uh, people like uh, uh, Steve Walton, John Mearsheimer, you know, who are very much of the establishment political science, uh, you know, you know, people who were big cold warriors and and um, and the like, who said, oh, 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 you know, these people are Jewish and pro-Israel. We're all doing this stuff in the Middle East, you know, for for the sake of Israel. Iraq was all about Israel. Syria's about Israel. Iran's about Israel, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I'm very, very critical of Israeli policies and U.S. Mm -hmm. support for Israeli policies, as you know. Uh, but um, really, the, the the problem is empire. <laughs> It's yeah, just, right. I, I, it's wish, exactly I wish it was just the Israel right. lobby. If it was yeah. just the Israel lobby, we, be yeah, we, we, we have a better chance of stopping it. But it's yeah. much, much bigger than that. It's about, it's about empire. And Israel is, 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 a, is a piece of it. I mean, it's yeah. certainly a, it's a player. A, 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 it's a player. It's a, it's a surrogate in many, many respects. We have joint, uh, we have joint uh, interests with certain right-wing elements within, uh, within, within Israel where our, 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 our um, goals coincide. Right. But um, I think it's, what, what, what Dan is saying here is really important. It's, a, it's, it's, it's a much bigger than that. It's about empire. And, uh, and let, let's not try to, to put the blame on an ethnic minority group. Let's look at the big picture right. yeah. where it really... Yeah, this, yeah. This we, is, have, we have the war economy. I mean, this entire yeah. country this, is so dependent on this, war. It's this, our number one export. Yeah. Like, there, yeah. there's, there's a mm -hmm. whole structural thing that is not absolutely related to these current events or this kind of like specific mm -hmm. country history. I yeah. mean, it's well, the, more, the, but this, this is larger a, project of mm -hmm. empire that's mm -hmm. being this, resurrected. This, this, is a, this is a set of policies that arose in the late 1890s. Right. You know, there was that entire period from 1868 to 1888 when uh, the, the, the rise of the robber baron era, the, the major industrialists that began to assert mm -hmm. their power through Brown Brothers Harriman and Sullivan and Cromwell. The, this entire operation that was that was going... Remember that the 
the grandfather of John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles, uh, John W. Foster, who was the Secretary of State uh, in, that, in that period of time. This is when they took over the Philippines, they took over Hawaii, they, they mounted the, the, Cuba, the yeah. invasion of Cuba, the Spanish-American War. This, this entire ethos of imperium, uh, the, 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 and both John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles were, were taught this by their grandfather at their grandfather's knee, mm -hmm. along with, with uh, uh, Robert uh, Levington, I think his name, who mm -hmm. was the son-in-law of John Foster, uh, John W. Foster, who was the Secretary of State for Wilson, uh, and were there at Versailles. Mm -hmm. the, 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 these, the, this imperial ambition yeah. that exists on the part of a, of a set of Federalist people, all the way from Alexander Hamilton and the, in, in the major financial powers that represented the Federalists at that time, uh, you know, the, this has been a strain inside the American culture ever since the founding of the country, right. of these elitists who did not believe in democracy, did not believe in fundamental rights of individual citizens. Yeah. This kind of elite has existed inside the United States. They've made, their, they've made their play at the end of the Cold War to reassert that type of imperial ambition mm -hmm. to the point of actually generating full front page stories in the New, in the New York mm -hmm. Times uh, Sunday Magazine saying American empire get used to it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, remember mm -hmm. that thing? I mean, mm -hmm. like we were all supposed to say, well, okay, I guess in pointing mm -hmm. out that the, actually pointing out that the, the United <coughs> Kingdom was getting a bad rap for what they did in India. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is how close it <laughs> yeah. came, the, the kind of yeah. rising crescendo of rationalizing what was going on here right. until they've run into this resistance actually mm -hmm. from the Islamicists in the Middle East pushing them out of the Holy Land. Mm -hmm. And that's what this is all about. If, if the United States would withdraw its military forces from those areas, which, which Obama professes to be wanting to do, mm -hmm. right. uh, you know, the, the, the cause of the... Right after he the, closes Guantanamo. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. <laughs> yeah, but, but what I'm saying yeah. is that, that the, our American mm -hmm. people need to understand that the time is now ripe yeah. for rising up and opposing this entire operation. And I think we can do so most effectively on the local basis by getting our city councils and, and county boards of supervisors to pass these constitutional protection zones where they will actually refuse to abide by the, the the Patriot Act and the National Defense Authorization Act, and have our own local law enforcement authorities refuse to enforce these statutes. Uh, th this is a, a an act of civil disobedience, a rising up and taking direct action against the against this national security state mm -hmm. in a way that was considerably more focused than just the Occupy Wall Street uh, yeah. issue. Th this is a, a short term mm -hmm. focus that we can have now to shut down the rise of this national security state and turn it. Back. So, so speaking of the rise of the national security state, um, I know you were involved with the Pentagon Papers case, mm -hmm. and could you talk about a little bit of the difference between Daniel Ellsberg and Bradley Manning or someone like Julian Assange? Like, you know, they're both really under attack, have been, you know, Assange is still holed up in the Ecuadorian embassy yeah. in London. Uh, Chelsea Manning has now been um, convicted of what thirty five years, some ridiculousness. Yeah, thirty five years for yes. And, and, well, so the, the, I mean, the, just, we need to understand this. This this began. It's a little intimidating well, to try and organize this. Uh, it's <laughs> this resistance when, quite frankly, it seems like they have our number already. Well, well, I it's, mean, it's they, 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 there's there's no doubt that they have I increased their power yeah. uh, since 1971. When 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 I got the call from Jim Goodell. Right. Uh, the executive vice president and general counsel for the New York Times, and came to our office and sat in the meeting where he first informed us that they had the Pentagon Papers. Uh, and, and as it says in the book, I was the very first one to tell them, let's print these things, because they were so intimidated about the possibility of being prosecuted for doing this. And I pointed out that there were... That United, was the newspaper? Yeah, the Times? Yeah, the New York Times. Yeah. And, and I said, you know, there's a United States Supreme Court case, U.S. v. Gorin, that was actually established uh, at the end of the end of World War uh, II, in which the federal government attempted to prosecute a young uh, lieutenant in the, in the Navy for sharing the, sh the sailing schedules of the U.S. Uh, military fleets out of the, uh, Pearl Harbor with British, uh, with British intelligence so they could coordinate their shipping together. And he was prosecuted, and the United States Supreme Court ruled that the Espionage Act, on the face of it, was inherently overbroad and vague about you know, revealing national security information. You couldn't tell quite what they were talking about. And they said that unless and until you impose an absolute prerequisite at any espionage charge 
that the person charged had a, a, an evil intent, had a specific right. malevolent intent to, to gather information and to give it to a specific foreign enemy for the express purpose of injuring our country, that you could not constitutionally prosecute someone under the Espionage Act. And that was what we relied upon in the Pentagon Papers case. We pointed out to Judge Murray Gerfine in our first meeting in chambers with him, with, with Whitney North Seymour, the U.S. attorney in there for the, for the uh, Nixon administration, arguing that, that they could not prosecute under the Espionage Act. And we prevailed in that argument. And then we point out, therefore, they didn't have any authority. There was no statutory authority that they had whatsoever to prosecute anybody. And, uh, and what they then, they resorted to inherent authority. They claimed that the executive branch had the inherent authority with the judicial branch to come together to actually punish someone by judicial fiat you know, without any legislation whatsoever for it. That, that is one of those high watermarks of the national security state. Actually going back, failing fundamentally to understand that our federal government is a government of limited powers that have been grant delegated specific authority by our people in the Constitution. They do not have inherent authority. The executive does not have inherent authority to just go and attack countries without any authority to do so. That what we've got to do is we have to reestablish the Constitution, get people to understand that the Constitution is just not some ship that sits in the harbor in Boston. Right. You know, this, this is an important document that sets specific limitations on the power of our executive branch branch. Mm -hmm. And it's time for the American people to reassert our power and to take this power back from this unilateral executive. Because, because they, may, they may feel somewhat sanguine by having a nice guy in there like Obama. Yeah. Which is had, even more dangerous than a bumbling well, idiot right. like Bush. Yeah, but, well, you, you put, but you put a guy like Dick Cheney uh, into the White House, right. or one heartbeat away from the White House, right. and, and basically running the operation from behind right. the scenes, uh, you know, then you, you've got a, a dyed-in-the-wool authoritarian in position there. Yeah. And these are dangerous principles, mm -hmm. and we've elucidated these, and now... The, the, the Bush administrations and Reagan and the others, they've appointed 93, or excuse me, 83 percent of all of the federal judges, many of whom come from the Federalist Society, aptly right. enough named, who are complete reactionaries. So the, the American people have to rise up. We can't rely upon mm -hmm. the courts right now. We right. can't rely upon the, the executive branch. No matter how nice a guy they think Obama is, he's, he's killed more people with the unilateral uh, uh, tax uh, with drones than the, than the uh, Bush administration did in their entire eight years. Right. You know, so that we can't rely upon these people. We have to take this power back ourselves. So we need to gather together and discuss this this. We need to understand what the, the history of it is and how we got here and what the concrete options are that we have right now. That's what we need to do. And that's why I'm inviting people to come, I say, to Cruzio's on the night of the 19th, to come to Logos on the, on the night of the 25th, and to call the, the uh, Santa Cruz Bookshop because they will convene a community meeting where we can all talk about what we want our city council and our, our county board of supervisors to do to help protect us. That's great. Um, I just want to say really quickly that uh, this is, again, Voices from the Village. I'm still Sandino Gomez. We're talking with Danny Sheehan and Steven Zunis um, live right now, September 8th. I was right earlier. And, um, yeah, I just want to invite you to call in. This is, uh, again, if you're watching September 8th, a live show. So the number just appeared right there, 425-8844. Um, if you have a question or a comment for uh, Danny or Steven, please do feel free to jump in here. Um, I don't know if that, and extend that invitation to our studio audience as well, of course. I saw uh, someone maybe by the microphone, I don't know if she's still interested in asking her question. Um, I mean, this is, this is deep. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You just ruined my whole understanding of the American government, folks. Whoa, are yeah. they not there like mom, pop, apple pie to protect me? Jeez. Well, one, one, one thing, uh, a couple of things that, that, uh, that, uh, that do give me hope is I think people are, I mean, the skepticism about yeah. the whole Syria pl uh, plan is, is, is very exciting to see um, uh, you know, people on a very pragmatic level, not, 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 not even a particular ideo ideological level, right. you know, raising these concerns. And, and they remember uh, you know, how, um, not, not, not just uh, you know, Bush and Cheney and Rumsfeld, uh, but, um, but, but then Senators Joe Biden and John Kerry, you know, insisted they ha 
got all this evidence that 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 Iraq had all these uh, so-called weapons of mass destruction. Um, John Kerry said, you know, they have more um, more chemical and biological weapons now, meaning 2002, uh, than they did before the uh, Gulf War, when in fact they totally eliminated them 10 years ago. And and Kerry was briefed by Scott Ritter, you know, the chief weapons inspector, yeah, right. and told him that Iraq had achieved at least qualitative disarmament. I had written about this in a number of academic journals. I had the cover story in the Nation magazine, The Case Against War, where I spelled out exactly if we invade Iraq, we'd be bogged down in bloody counterinsurgency war amid rising sectarianism, uh, uh, terrorism. Um, and, and, check, and, check, and, check. I pretty much na- I yeah. called it, unfortunately. Yeah. And so it's not like these people didn't know. Right. Um, and 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 and, 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 um, and now you know Kerry and, and Biden are the big water carriers saying, hey, we, say, we, we have all this proof. We can't show it to you. But we have all this proof. <laughs> just you trust gotta, us. us. Um, e- even in, and, and Nancy Pelosi, who's again really, really. Uh, you know, twisting the arms big time of um, her Democratic colleagues. You know, she was saying that the the, the, the serious use of chemical weapons are undeniable. Well, I remember you know, back in 2002 and Meet the Press in November, uh, she said that there's no question that Iraq had um, chemical weapons. So uh, people, I mean, I, I think people are starting to wake up. People, mm-hmm. I, the people are, I mean, ironically, I think, again, in this case, uh, Syria probably did use, <laughs> use the chemical weapons, but the very fact that people are, 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 are questioning this is, is, I think, a very, very positive sign. I think it shows a, a degree of, um, really, a greater maturity yeah. in the American public. And, and I, you know, I, I'm sure you remember this, uh, some of the, because you're one of, the, one, of the people, uh, one of the people who uncovered these memos, and I remember how there was some mention about, in case of a, you know, some of the plans for escalating uh, American aggression in Central America, that we had to keep this information yeah. from the enemy. They kept referring to the enemy. Well, the enemy they were referring to was not the Sandinistas, not the FMLN, not the Cubans or the Soviets. They are talking about the American people. That's right. You know, the people who, who <clears throat> dare to challenge this national security state. Wow. That's right. So was that about hope? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, yeah that, but the hope, hope, com, hope, no, hope it, comes from below. And, and I, I agree. Think, and, and, and I think that... Um, um, Another thing about Obama, I think, is that despite all my profound disappointments on so, so many levels, on, 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 on certain ways he is, is somewhat more pragmatic. He realizes there are limits to American power, right. and uh, that uh, that uh, you know there, there are certain battles that uh, that um, you know has to be we have to be more selective, I guess uh, you could say, in terms of uh, of projecting American power. And so that, that's why I think, I think um, you know, despite uh, the many similarities between the two parties, I think uh, you know one one thing is that uh, that the. The, the, the Republicans are pretty hopeless in terms of change, but the Dem- Democrats can be forced. Because I've seen how in Vietnam, you know, went to all, virtually all the Democrats supporting the Vietnam War, um, and, 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 and by 1972, virtually all the Democrats were, were, were opposed to it. I saw how Andrew Young, former civil rights activist, vetoed sanctions against South Africa in uh, 1977, but by 1986 you had enough votes in the Republican-controlled Senate to override Reagan's veto to impose sanctions. Wow. I remember, you know, Mondale and other Democrats in 1980, blocking a, a minority plank for a nuclear freeze. Uh, when uh, um, Mondale and others were running for president four years later, they were saying, I've been for the freeze since day one. Um, uh, if you look at East Timor, if you look at Iraq, if you look at these, uh, these other, other issues, um, yeah, they, 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 uh, rarely, with a few conscious ex- exceptions, uh, Democrats, liberal Democrats, have rarely led. They've generally been dragged, kicking and screaming, <laughs> right. you know, by their constituents. <laughs> and so I, I think it's um, you know, so. So I, I mean, I think we should be definitely skeptical. We should not be not not be naive about the Democratic Party, but at the same time, not be cynical, because I really do think a, 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 a mobilized citizenry uh, can make a difference. We've seen it. Uh, we, we've seen it many times before, and 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 we we, 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 we just need to keep on pushing. I can't remember the name of the uh, representative. But but he's from Oregon, and he actually published um, the results of constituents contacting him on the Syria issue, mm-hmm. and it was like you know three thousand to eighteen. <laughs> yeah. It was like insane. Yeah. So yeah, the, I mean, it the, seems people, like people, the people are rising up. The people, right. the people are definitely disgusted by hurt. this thing now. Yeah, and uh, and it's it's extraordinary. However, you, you see the mainstream media, the mainstream media just beating the war drums. Right. I mean, you know that uh, Blitzer, Blitzer just basically excoriating anybody who came on that tried to suggest they ought to really. Mm-hmm. Consider uh, some alternative, mm-hmm. you know. And on NBC, you get one person saying, "You know, look at this: is the 50th anniversary of Dr. Martin Luther King, as well as the weekend everybody's cr- crying to attack Syria." He says, yeah. 
Yeah. Okay, he's 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 praying and pleading for us to find uh, political solutions to these things. That there's nothing going to be solved by this type of a bombing. Right. You know, I mean, it, it'd be different if the United States and its sanctimoniousness had attacked every single person who had violated one of the international laws. Mm -hmm. You know, of, of slavery, of of uh, you know white slavery, of uh, torture, you know, of uh, mass exterminations. You know, but they don't. What they do is they select these particular people who just happen yeah. to be in oil producing countries mm -hmm. and and it, it, it doesn't or have just different ideology it, it, I mean it doesn't, you look, it doesn't you look, take out anybody like, yeah yeah, yeah that's like the, you know like if like, like, he were saying oh we have to act unilaterally because the Soviets and Chinese or Russians and Chinese well, are using 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 their vetoes well yeah. I, did, I did and and and, I, and they vetoed three previous resolutions on Syria which I actually thought were quite reasonable they did not call for intervention and I've been very disappointed with the, with the Russians and Chinese support of, of, of the Assad regime uh, to be honest but the the, 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 the sanctimonious stuff about uh, well, Samantha Power say the other day that they are holding the UN hostage, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I did a little research. Okay, since China joined the United Nations in the early 70s, they've used their veto power eight times. The Russians, and prior to that, the Soviet Union, during that same period, um, they've used it 18 times. During the same period, again, early 70s to the present, the United States has used its veto power 83 times. Wow. Um, and, you know, there, there's, um, and, and most of it, most of those were to either defend itself or allies like Israel uh, from uh, criticism for violations of international humanitarian law. You know, very, very, very similar things we're, we're going after Syria about. Um, uh, you know, also, you know, there's there's upset again for good reason uh, that Russia was supplying the uh, the uh, the regime with helicopter gunships. We had administration officials quoting Amnesty International saying, "Oh, you should you know don't send helicopter gunships to to the Syrian regime." And again, I I, I can't argue with that. But um, the, <laughs> the right but, but 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 Amnesty International, they, what they didn't mention was Amnesty International in the past few years has also called off of the United States to stop sending helicopter gunships to Israel, to Turkey, to right. Colombia for the same reason. They're being used against civilians. Right. And so I, I, I think it, 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 the... Um, so, so, so this is what I'm just going to confirm what Dan, Dan, is, Dan is saying. It's not that these, um, these governments the U.S. is going after aren't doing terrible things, yeah. but we're being highly selective Which in, terms of, uh, in terms of, 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 of what, should be, what should be enforced. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm sorry, guys. I know we could keep going on this, but I've just been informed by our, our lead camera person over there that we are actually out of time. Where can people find out more information about you, Stephen, and, and the articles that you write? You can find them on my website, www.stephenzunas.org. That's okay. S-T-E-P-H-E-N-Z-U-N-E-S, stephenzunas.org. I teach at the University of San Francisco, but I live, live here in Santa Cruz. Great. Uh, and I, um, um, we'll keep an ear out for you. Yeah. <laughs> Danny, where can you find more information about you they, and your they, book? Your they, they, book. They, they can find out uh, about our stuff on danielpsheehan.org. Uh, and they can find out about... Uh, uh, and they can find out about the Lakota People's Law Project that we're doing up in, in South Dakota Great. at lakotalaw.org. Uh, DanielPSheehan.com. <laughs> Daniel, I'm I, notified by I just my Googled staff. your name and found yeah. it right away. So, DanielPSheehan.com. Yeah. Awesome. It tells all about what we're doing. Well, thank you so much, you guys. It's really been a very interesting conversation. Um, thank you, Santa Cruz. We hope to see you next time here on Voices from the Village. I'm Sandino Gomez. I've been here with uh, Stephen Zunis and Danny Sheehan, and we just want to thank you very much for watching. Uh, be sure to tell your friends, please, 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 do not um, attack Syria. You know, uh, what's, what's the great phrase? You know, bombing for peace is sort of like screwing for virginity. So I think that's the situation we're in here, and that'll be your thought for the night. Thank you so much. Have a great one. Good night.